All right, we're continuing our talk of the Dirty Dozen, and we've made it through four so far. Nobody really knows how many I've left. All right, so uh, number five is distractions. Distractions can be things like a dog. <laughs> or what? Number four. See, look, I got distracted. It's the wrong slide, that's all. I'm on slides. Did we already talk? No, we, we kind of ended up talking about, we, we were talking about distractions, right? Yesterday, if I remember correctly. And I don't always. <clears throat> and we didn't actually make any notes on that, did we? Which I think is the problem, but we did talk about it, correct? So. You talked about a gas line. Yeah, I talked about my NTSB gas line incident, and and uh, which was actually very similar to what happened to this aircraft, right? So <laughs> then I had the rule about, hey, when you put it put it together, you put it on all the way, complete it, finish it. And I also talked about uh, my big rule when you're putting on fuel lines that you always put it on, and you put that this yellow paint on. It it's actually comes in different colors. But I like yellow, but a little paint on it. It's a lacquer paint, and what happens is you go across. A component that rotates and so if it rotates then the paint breaks and you can have a visual visual indication that the, the item is coming loose but that's not really why I put it on I put it on to remind myself and to give a visual clue that I was there I finished it and I torqued it I'm gonna tell you what it's I just it's hard to believe that somebody would just kind of come along with some paint and go I probably torqued it right you're gonna at least say well let's just double check that before I put this paint on so so, but we didn't write any notes, did we? All right, so distractions. So, loss of focus. Mental or emotional confusion. Uh, or disturbance. Now, let me see what we got. Um, it draws one's that draws one's attention. Away. All right, so what are some of the safety nets? Well, what do you guys think? What, what could be a, a good safety net for distractions? Let's think about some distractions. What can you do about it? All right, I heard it. My number one answer. Put the phone away. Put the phone away. When I'm working on my airplane, I put my phone on silent, put it in the car, leave it there. I will go check it when the appropriate time comes because whatever's gonna call in is probably not gonna be as important as what I'm currently doing right now. I have people I care about in the airplane. Zeus down here, huh? Yeah, he doesn't go with me in the airplane. All right, uh, what else we got? Yeah. yeah. Uh, nets. What's before nets? I can't... Safety nets. Safety. Okay, thank you. Come on guys, give me some answers. I should work alone or shouldn't work alone? No visitors. Oh, that's a good one. I don't actually have that one. Uh, okay. So how about finish the job before you walk away? I like that. You got to be assertive. Tell people, hey, don't bother me while I'm working. Now put up a sign around your neck. I'm working. Leave me alone. Maybe a t-shirt says, go away. If you see this shirt, go away. Um, how about, okay, so I call this one, I call it Smitty's Rule because there's a guy I worked with and he's the one who, who told me this one. So always, always fully install even if you tend to take it off later. So always fully install slash finish the job 
even, oops, thinking, even if you think you may take it off later. Because like with the hose thing, that's just real common. People putting hoses on. Well, I'm just going to get all the hoses on real quick and make sure that I got his you got them all. If you're working on some a complicated engine that's more than just a carburetor, you may have a lot of hoses. One that comes uh, from the firewall, the fuel pump, fuel pump to uh, servo, servo to a flow divider, flow divider out, or uh, various and so things. So you may have taken them all off, sent them out, and bought new hoses, have them made, come back in a box. You got five, six, seven hoses. You're like, hmm, not sure where they go. I'll just put them all on finger tight and see which ones go, and then I'll go along and tighten them later, right? Probably not the best idea, unless you've got a plan to make sure that you get them all on. So do that. Uh, let me see. Uh, tag unairworthy items. Ooh, there we go. Use a checklist. Unairworthy. Tag unairworthy items. Use a checklist. And if you use a checklist, you get interrupted. Go back three steps. Did I finish that? Yep. Back, back, back. <clears throat> see what we got for lack of teamwork. Lack of teamwork. Oh, hmm. Got an airplane running into a tug. Well, how about this one? On time departures are very important for airlines. It's prudent to have wing walkers watching the action during the pushback. They're vital members of the team. There are times when the airlines allow the tug driver to conduct pushback alone because there are no wing walkers available. And this is just such a case. Can you see the lab truck? Oh yeah, let me see, hang on. A laser pointer. Right behind this jet engine, what do you see? A truck, man. A truck. You see the lab truck parked behind the engine. And this represents about $250,000 worth of damage. Quarter of a million dollars. Worked with a guy who always said, Takes a whole lot of attaboys to make up for one aw crap. <laughs> All right, lack of teamwork. Uh, that is lack of working together. To achieve a common goal. Safety net. Well, how about communicate? <clears throat> Talk to each other. Let people know what's going on. Let Share people knowledge. know what they're... Share knowledge. Yeah. Let them know what they're... What they expect of them. I work for Alaska, and that's a big thing. Like <coughs> when we do a turn, yeah. go over like a pre fry pre-flight huddle, like, all right, you're responsible for this, you're responsible for this, that way if something doesn't happen, all right, well, we can go back and someone can be held accountable for it. Great example. Uh, let's see, follow procedures. So imagine in that example, let's just say the procedure was you can never, as a tug driver, you can never push back unless you had a wing walker on each side. So if you're not familiar, wing walkers literally walk um, I like to put my hand on the wing and I literally walk next to the wing the whole time. And you watch and make sure that this wing doesn't get hit. Uh, maybe I'm looking back towards the tail or wherever I'm going to be looking. <clears throat> I'm watching two things at once. So suppose that was the procedure. But here's a tug driver. Man, I got to push back. You know, they're waiting to go. The captain's yelling at me. It's got to go on a long time. So, you know, you're thinking, what's it going to hurt? Well, 
hurts a lot. <laughs> so, and then what Robert said, right? Confirmed duties. I can tell you from experience, people get mad when you got to sit on the plane for three hours because something went wrong. So. Yeah, it's like, would you rather sit an extra two minutes waiting for wing walkers, or would you rather have your flight canceled because you just shoved the aircraft into a truck? Yeah. <laughs> All right, here's something that's going to start getting you guys. Fatigue. Fatigue. <clears throat> So we got be aware of the symptoms and look for them in yourselves. Plan to avoid complex tasks at the bottom of your circadian rhythm. Sleep and exercise regularly. Ask others to check your work. Uh, <clears throat> what's a circadian rhythm? Yeah, it's well, it's kind of your cycle of, of, of uh, sleep wake, but we all have a natural circadian rhythm. And no matter who you are or you know, what hours you work, you have as a human. We, are, we kind of have it ingrained in us. We have certain times of the day where we're kind of uh, alert and awake and do our best work, and then we, we drop off and go into this valley. When you think about, you know, about that three o'clock time, not here, because you're just getting here, but you're at home, it's kind of sleepy, I could use a cookie or two, you know, and, uh, and that, that happens through the night too. So a lot of studies about working night shifts, how bad that is for you, and how you really can't get out of that cycle. So knowing these kind of things, knowing, hey, I'm going to be very tired during this time. Or, um, you know, I, I actually plan out my day for the most complicated tasks when I have the most energy. You know, if I've got a, a day where, I've, you know, something very important is planned, a difficult task that I really have to focus on. Um, i trying to think, you know, one of the, the things that, that I used to do that, was, that kind of took the most focus and I didn't hate doing it. It was just really intense was sometimes setting up, uh, I would set up gears on uh, engines that were at vertical or 90 degree drive, big gears on vertical uh, helicopter engines. And they come with these shim packs that you know, look like a piece of paper, but you get a magnifying glass in there and you can actually use a razor blade and you would peel off like um, just fractions of a thousandth of an inch. When you peel it off, it just kind of crumble. It's weird to roll up. Anyway, but you peel them off and you'd have two different ones. You have to move a gear this down and one in, down, in, down, in, until you got this perfect alignment. And it would take a couple hours. You know, I'd, practice, I'd do something like that when I was really feeling good and knew I was, you know, wide awake and going. Not at 3 o'clock when I was just kind of dragging, you know. Uh, all right, so anything exciting there? Nope, I don't have anything exciting for that one. All right, so fatigue. Weariness. Weariness from labor or exertion. Nervous exhaustion. Temporary loss of power and ability to respond so we can weariness weariness from labor you're working hard or exhaust exertion hey what about the weather think that would make you a little fatigued yes. yeah I will shorten that up symptoms So what are some symptoms of fatigue? What's that? Eyes are getting heavy. Um, reduced attention. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You guys are sitting there working hard on book work today. How many times you have to read the same thing over and over? Like, gosh, I just read that three times. I don't even know what I read. Uh, reduced attention, diminished memory. You get a little cranky with me? Really? You're not going to sign this off? Come on! <laughs> Low situational awareness. You start to be. Oops. Let's see. Let's make this one a D. Uh, you start to almost not even notice what's going on around you. And then. What's that? <laughs> illness. Ill illness will do that. Boy, if you're sick, of course, then you start taking cold medicine, then you're just out of it, right? Um, and then I got feeling stress. Is that low something? Low situational awareness. 
the game is you kind of have to listen to what I say and then see what I wrote and put the two things together. I think that's what he wrote. About um, turning yourself in. Okay, let's talk about safety nets. So, I definitely think that that's an appropriate thing to do. Um, and that's I want to my, my yeah take a break. So, well, first thing is you got to be aware of the symptoms. By knowing this, knowing in yourself what you feel like when you start to get to fatigued and you are not thinking clearly, when you know yourself, then you have to be your own, own best friend and remove yourself from the situation. So be aware of it. Uh, of course, sleep and exercise regularly. Well, that's a great piece of advice, but how about somebody who is in an A&P program six hours a day, working full time, and I'm telling you to go home and get some sleep. You're thinking, yeah, right, that sounds great. Exercise. I exercise regularly. I do it at least once every month, and that, so that is regular, right? And if I don't, Zeus over there gets really mad at me, and he comes in and he literally jumps on my my desk at home. He says, "Let's go for a walk." All right. So this comes right back to a full circle. If you know you're fatigued, tell somebody. Have them check your work. Have them check your work. It is absolutely great to work with somebody who you trust unconditionally. And you can go to them and say, look, I am so stressed. I'm tired. I'm fatigued. I don't feel well. Could you take five minutes when you get a chance and go check what I just did? Because I just don't feel it. You know, and I've had great buddies who would, who would you know, do that with me. I'd do that with them. You go over, look at the work. Hey, Kev, looks great, man. Of course, you'd never make a mistake. Right? All right. Lack of resources. That is, you think that's something you really have to worry about in aviation much? Yeah. Well, it's back to the Magneto thing. If you don't have the correct. Oh, somebody was awake for that one. Thank you for that. So many times a book is going to call for an exact thing and you're like, I don't have that exact thing. So what are you going to do? Well, well, look around this room. I'm looking at a whole bunch of mechanics. I know what mechanics do. We are the can do, get it done kind of people of this world. Don't tell me I can't do something. I'm an aircraft mechanic. I'm going to jack that plane up. I don't have the right jacks. I got a set of jacks. Any set of jacks to be the right jacks, right? Make a little adapter or something. I can weld. Before you know it, you got something welded up and going on that's just not the right thing, and all kinds of bad thing happens. Uh, let's see, sus uh, check suspect areas at the beginning of the inspection and AOG of the required parts. What is AOG? Aircraft on, aircraft on ground. Isn't that a funny thing to say? What that means is we're in a hurry. We got an aircraft on the ground and it shouldn't be. Uh, so that's a, a phrase you have to get used to in aircraft. Man, that thing's AOG. It means it shouldn't be there. It shouldn't be on the ground. So what they're saying is, hey, you're, you've got a plane that's coming in for an inspection, some type of maintenance. You should think ahead about what it is you need to accomplish that and get it ordered before the plane shows up. And then, you know, even a routine oil change. Hey, guys, I got a plane coming in today for an oil change. It's one of our best customers. Uh, he's going to drop it off at noon, he's going to be back at 3, and he's got to make a flight somewhere very important. It's very important to him, all right? All right. The plane rolls in, you're like, yeah, boss, um, we don't have that oil filter that he needs, or that oil, or whatever, you know? And it's like, oh, come on, you know? Then, then, then you start hurrying. Then it starts this chain reaction, right? Now one of the defenses is down, we're looking for a hole in the cheese. Things start, bad starts happening. Uh, Order stock anticipated parts before they're required, well, easier said than done. Uh, knowing all available parts sources and arrange for pooling or loaning and maintain a standard, if in doubt, ground the aircraft. Uh, when I ran a cylinder shop, I had, you know, like one of my things I did is I stocked enough to do like one set of six for every kind of cylinder I could think of. So if I got a six in, I always had enough parts to do six complete overhauls on whatever cylinder it was. So. When I got something in that was an AOG cylinder, which I had a lot of customers who would bring me their cylinders. Man, I got an AOG, this cylinder's gotta get fixed. I, I gotta sit here and wait for it. And I'm like, well, it's gonna be two hours. Like, I'm waiting right here. 
like, all right, you know, it was important that I had the parts and I could, I could get it done. So. All right, so what do we got? Lack of resources. How might this affect you guys in class? Hey, we're going to run into that. Don't have enough books. I ran out of uh, the general book. All right? I only have enough to loan out. You're supposed to have your own. I had a couple left. Uh, FAR books. Only had a couple of them. You guys need them. Pretty soon, we're going to start doing other projects. You're going to start measuring crankshafts. Guess how many crankshafts I've got? got four or five? Now, look around. How far is that going to go? i got seven cylinders, I think. We're going to have a lack of resources. I only have so many micrometers to go around, so many T-gauges to go around, so many, you know. So that's going to start causing a stress buildup in you because you know you need to get these projects done. And so what are you going to do? Natural tendency is to get stressed out, and you're going to hurry. I just got to get it done. All right? Number one thing I hear, second week of 309, I just got to get it done. Well, you do just got to get it done. We'll talk about that. Did you remember day one, day two? All right, uh, let's see. Failure to use or acquire appropriate tools. To use or acquire the appropriate tools. Uh, tools, equipment. information uh, procedures procedures uh, let's see safety net all right so we kind of talked about that plan plan the job just like what I'm expecting you to do had a lot of people say, hey, when, when is this project one in lab due? There's no due date. I don't care when you turn it in. You've got to do it first before you do the next thing. It's up to you. You can do it the last day if you want. I just hope on the last day you can do all the other ones at the same time. Right? So you need to plan the job. I'm not going to micromanage your time over across the street. So you've got to figure out, you've got what, four projects? Um, four or five projects? The last one is going to be the longest. It may take you all week to get that one done. So don't look at it and say there's, I don't I, since I shortened, I forget how many projects are. How many projects are I got? Six. six projects. Don't look at it and go, what, six projects? I got 10 days, so as long as I do, you know, do the math, figure it out, one point something per day, oh, I'm good to go. It doesn't work that way, right? Because some of them are going to take you a long time to do. Measuring is going to take you probably two days. The electricity is probably going to take you three days. Math should take you at home time, right? So plan the job, how long it's going to take. Uh, make sure everything's available. Make sure parts are available. Uh, let's see. This is a big one. Maintain a standard. And do not violate that standard. It takes a little bit of moxie and it's really hard when you're new to do that. And I remember being new and I remember having things that I knew weren't right. I, having people ask me to do things that I knew weren't quite right. And it's a very difficult time when you're very new and you're thinking, man, I, I learned that I shouldn't be doing that, but yet this guy who's been doing it for 20 years is telling me to do that. And you've got to find a way to not be aggressive, and I don't even, I, even assertive is the right word when you're really new, but to somehow reconcile that and say, can I ask you, you know, this is what I learned in a &P school, but they always told us not to do this, or, you know, this is something I read. Um, why, why are we allowed to do it? You know, find a nice way to ask that. And yeah, you might learn some stuff and, you know, it might straighten you out. Might, you might have been misinformed or the person may be misinformed. Uh, once you get a little more experience under your belt, then you can get a little more assertive and you say, ah, I'm not doing that. No, 
I've had some people ask me to do some crazy things. And uh, thankfully, I was, you know, a very seasoned, experienced mechanic. I said, yeah, I'm not doing that. You do that if you want. I don't so. But you got to get to that point. All right, so lack of resources. Oh, we just did that one. Um, boy, there's a lot of them in there. Is that by management? <clears throat> What's that? Is that by management? You mean? Yeah, I was fortunate that the place I worked at, well, what I would tell them, as the chief inspector, I would tell the people under me, we got a great boss. And this is what I want you to do. The first words out of your mouth, no matter how crazy it is the boss asks you to do something, the first word out of your mouth would be, yes, sir, I'm on it. And you better mean it. You mean it. Yes, sir, I'm on it. Then if you have something that it concerns you, then tell them. I'm on it. I'm going to do it right now. However, however, this is a concern I have. He had a great boss. He'd always listen to that. Oh, that's a valid concern. Yes, let's, let's, talk, let's ask Kevin about that. You know, hey, Kevin, we're going to go do that. Nah, you can't, can't quite do that. That's not going to work out well. So, just building rapport. All right, this is going to hit you bad. Pressure. You got a lot of, a lot of things to do, not much time to do it. Pressure. What do we got here? <coughs> Pressure. Oh, I missed a lack of resources. Oh, well. I'm under too much pressure to get this done. Airline ground crew accident happened in, to, in Taiwan to U.S. airline. The aircraft was pushed back before the number two cabin door was closed and before the air bridge was retracted. So how did this happen? Apparently at the last minute, there was a gate call to accept four late show passengers. The cabin door had already been closed. The purser reopened the door without informing the captain. The captain then requested the tug to push back the aircraft. This very, very neatly removed the number two door. <laughs> I like their wording. I, this, I'm quoting from this. So yes, there is no door left right here. So it is now gone. That is one way to do it. If you have to remove a door, just use the jetway. Very expensive way. Yes, it is. All right, pressure. Uh, cr creating a sense of urgency or haste. What do I hear? I just need to get this done. I hear it all the time. Let me tell you exactly what's going to happen. In this class and every class I teach, we get near the end, people start to realize that there's not enough days left in the semester to get the projects left there becomes this mad push to get through it. So the work drops down to garbage. And I get garbage work, I have an oral, it goes horribly, and I just say, I look at the work and say, this is terrible, you can do it all over again. But we have an oral, and uh, the oral just goes badly and said, you're not ready for this. You go away and study some more, go see me tomorrow. So how is that helping the person to get through faster? It's, it's, it's twice as long. So don't do that. I, I can tell you, I can warn you, but that's exactly human nature. Is this, I gotta get it done, this rush, this I'm just gonna turn in this stuff. Yes, this is a school, but what I say, everything we're doing has got to be at airworthy standards. We're all aircraft mechanics, and I look at every project we do as though it's going on an aircraft, or this is an aircraft quality work that I'm looking for. Even if it's just an oral between us, I'm asking you questions. I'm expecting an airworthy response. So if it's not, then I ask you to do it again, and again, and again, and again. And at some point you think, all right, I guess I had better do this correctly. Safety net. By the way, you wanna know what my grading curve looks like? It's hilarious. All A's, a C, a B, and all these. I don't intend to do that. It's just, it goes by the points, it goes by the, but it's just, it's exactly the way, is that right, Katie? Yeah. <laughs> so, it's just, and I love giving A's, trust me. Ask my family. I'd, I'd love to see every person get an A. I, I would gladly explain 
to anybody who wants, well, how come your whole class got an ace? I just, they all deserved an A. I would not have a problem with that. But uh, so I do. So it's really easy to get an A, and it's just as easy to not. It's just hilarious how it goes. So uh, let's see. Katie's the one that alerted me. I know my grading curve, but she's kind of the one that is not afraid to tell me what's up. And she, what was the thing she said? She said, yeah. She goes, of course everybody gets an A like that. She says, because you just look at it and go, no. And she goes, you make people do it over and over and over until it's an A quality. And then you go, that's an A quality, and you get an A. You know, so anyway. So safety net, make sure pressure is not self-induced. All right, just in class. I got to get it done. I didn't say you had to get it done. I mean, obviously you have to. Or out in the field when you're working on a plane. Man, we just got to get this out. We got to push it back today. Why? Why do we just have to get it pushed out today and why are we in this big rush? Yep, yeah, but it works the same way out there as it works in this class. You push, you push, you push, you rush, you rush, you rush, and then what happens? And the old saying, how come there was never enough time to do it right, but we found enough time to do it twice? Make sure pressure is not self-induced. Uh, use proper plan. It's, you see what I'm doing? I'm writing on a right pad while it's up on a screen in front of me. It's not as easy as you think. You use proper planning. I had one manager who was not my favorite by a long shot. And he would, in order to try and get a bonus, he would push, try and push airplanes out. You know, just tell the customer, your airplane will be done on Friday. I guarantee it. And on Friday, there'd be this big big thing to push it back and get it out and I was always the one who'd walk in the office and go why why does it have to go today I need a reason That's poor ethics. it's poor it really was and everybody hated this guy and I would say why and uh, being in my office I could actually call the customer and go hey it's Kevin you know over shop hey uh looks like things are running a little bit long on your airplane uh, you, you gonna need it today or anything to tell you how many times I would get the uh yeah, we're in Hawaii. We're on vacation. We're in some. We're not even. No, I'm not using my airplane for another two months. I. But that's a weird, weird question. I'm like, ah, right, just, just checking. <laughs> well, I can go. Yeah, customer said he didn't need his airplane for two weeks. So, uh, communicate concerns. So not everything has got to be, you know, a negative or a sketchy thing. Hey, maybe the boss and the customer just had some agreement it would be done on Friday, or the guy just said, you know, hey, when do you think it would be done? The boss says, hey, it would be done on Friday. Hey, awesome. You know, walk in and say, boss, you know, we're, we're running late on this. In fact, I've got two guys over on this plane that's got to go. We don't have enough manpower. Could you call up the customer and see if it, you know, we can just wait and put some other guys and some other stuff? More often than not, it's not a problem. The yeah. boss goes, yeah, yeah, hey, hey, no problem. You know, I'll, I'll take care of that for you. If it doesn't need to be done, we're good. Uh, ask for help. You're under the gun. You know something's got to get get at, uh, get out. Go ask the boss. Hey, could I have could I have a little bit of help on this thing? Um, this one's a little bit easier to say than than do. Say no. It's well, it's not really license and certificates. Your certificate on the line. Everybody says when the stuff hits the fan and it comes down to your fault, you did something wrong because you were pushed, all the fingers start pointing back at you. That's he did it. Well, you pushed me. No, I didn't. Uh, let's see. What do we got? Pressure. Oh, that brings us to. So if you're going to say no, you got to have some assertiveness. Lack of assertiveness. Uh, listen, I own the aircraft and I say it's not a bad leak. Oh, that reminds me of a horrible story. I'll tell you my story. So, went to work at a, at a place for a very short period of time. Um, I worked here in Sacramento and I ended up leaving. I went to Stockton for very like two, two to three weeks, and while I was there, 
the uh, the owner of the, I, I was doing an annual inspection on an aircraft and the cylinder was so cracked I mean this huge gigantic crack it was ready to blow the top of the head right off the engine right that's catastrophic failure and uh, I said, man it, you know we got to change out the cylinder we got this problem and the owner of the shop didn't back me on it and uh, him and the owner they came in and, and I'd explain myself to the owner and the owner and they said, you know, they started both of them arguing with me. It's not that bad of a crack. It's a horrible crack. Well, I don't think it's a crack. It's an absolute crack. I put some air in the cylinder and put some soap on it. It's such a big crack. It started blowing soap bubbles all over the shop. Okay, that's how bad of a crack it is. It's blowing air through the cylinder with just a little bit of shop air. What's it going to do when you start running the thing? Okay, okay. Well, the owner's an engineer. He knows cracks better than you do, and he says it's an okay crack, and he wants you to sign it off. I'm not going to do it. So the owner said, all right, fine. Well, then I'll sign the aircraft off. And I came in the next day, and I got my toolbox, and I left. I said, ah, I can't work for this place. So, you, is there ever a time where you would sign off any kind of crack to be airworthy? Or Yes, absolutely. Really? If there's if there's criteria, like Continental engines do have criteria for case cracks in a case, certain cases in certain areas, and they have data. And so, if you have data on it, then absolutely, if it meets the criteria. Uh, some magnetos are allowed to have cracks in the housing. They, I run across stuff that cylinders are a zero tolerance on that. This thing was literally spreading open and falling apart. And so, you just got to be a little assertive. Ah, if it's not critical, record it in the journal. Journal me log book. That's a Canadian thing. Um, refuse to compromise your standards. I like that one. Is there anything I got on here? Oh, okay, so here's a mishap that might not find its way in the headlines. It's funnier if you watch it on a little video because they do one at a time. So first say you're looking at this photo here and you're like, I don't care what I can see. It's an ambulance inside of a golf cart inside of a golf cart. It said uh, an ambulance pushes two golf carts. This mishap might not find its way in the headlines. An ambulance pushes two golf carts together, causing minor damage to the golf carts in the ambulance. You need to ask yourself the question, what caused the ambulance to squeeze the golf carts? Well, look at the aircraft's engine to sell. See how it's pushed the ambulance forward? Why did this happen? Notice the red line painted on the ramp just behind the policeman. Right there's a red line, apparently. Well, it's right there. Uh, let's see. It defines the safety area vehicles are not to park. What do we do as the ramp or maintenance people who witness an ambulance park on a safety area? Well, obviously, there was uh, more to the story, but anyway, that was lack of assertiveness. So I guess the point was, well, I know the point was, so, you know, an ambulance, ooh, safety people, you know, it's not my place to tell them, you know, so you got to be a little assertive. Hey, move the ambulance. That's an easy one, I think. It's, it's more difficult when you're actually facing somebody who's saying, hey, I need you to sign off for something, and you're like, yeah, I don't want to do that. So, um, but the thing is, you can't just be a jerk about it. So lack of assertiveness is lack of positive Communication. Of one's ideas. Wants or needs. So the place I worked at in Sacramento, I had a, like I said, I had a, a great boss, and that's what I told that's the place where I told everybody, you tell the boss, yes, yes, sir, I'm on it and then express your ideas. I always tell him, express to the boss. Tell him what's on your mind. He will listen. He will always listen and always did. And it, and it worked out 100% of the time. I'm on it, boss, but here's the problem. What you're asking me to do is, you know, that doesn't fit with this or that doesn't work with that. Is that, are you sure that's, you know, what you want? Ooh, yeah, I didn't realize that. Thank you for saying it. Thank you for bringing my attention. No, I, I don't want that. And it worked out all the time. Safety nets, uh, what do we got? Communicate. Communicate your concerns and then refuse to compromise your standards. gets us down to stress. Stress is not a bad thing. Sometimes stress is a good thing. 
I live on a little bit of snap. How about caffeine? A little bit of caffeine is a good thing. Too much is makes you a little bit jittery. All right, so here's a little chart of stress. Performance, high performance, low, low performance. Stress, low stress, high stress. When you have low stress, you're bored and your performance drops and you're like, Ugh, this is not fun, I am bored and you don't do a good job. And on the other end of the spectrum, when you're under an extreme amount of stress, then you try and rush things, things don't look good, you don't think clearly and it's bad, but somewhere in the middle is actually a good amount of stress. All right, and that's where you kind of want to live. I do anyway. So stress isn't always bad. Stress can be mental, emotional, or physical tension. Strain or distress. You know what stress is. Safety nets. Uh, be prepared. I think I always planned out my day before in my mind, uh, either on the drive home or on the drive in or both. I was always prepared for what I was going to do that day. Sometimes you don't get to make your choices, but you know, I always kind of had in my mind what the day was going to be like. I was prepared thinking it through, make sure I got enough sleep the night before, make sure I got enough food. View the problem rationally. In other words, think it through, you know? Want to talk about some stress? I'll tell you guys that the sewer pipe backed up in my house, flooded the whole downstairs with the poo. So my whole house is tore apart right now. Got no floor. It's terrible. Just when you think things can't get a whole lot worse, I find out my solar system quit working on me about a month ago. So I haven't been producing any solar. So I've been running off PG&E's money for my money for the last month and a half. Start to think about why maybe my sewer system backed up in a house that's nearly new. So I called a plumber out last week. Plumber came out, snaked it and said, problem is you got to change out the sewer line somebody hit it with a truck when they built the house and now it's all it's all crooked causing it to back up all these years how much is that going to cost thousand bucks maybe nah six seven fine so he came out jackhammered up my driveway yesterday replaced my sewer line came up this morning to finish everything off waved goodbye to him as he pulled out of my driveway turned around and i said literally what is wrong with the hot water heater, the water heater? My wife goes, what do you mean? There's mold all over it, all over the walls. There was a leak spraying all over the sheetrock for the last week. <laughs> Think that's a little bit of stress? <laughs> I gotta be here. I got one other job I take care of. And I'm in a master's program with a 15 page uh, dissertation due tomorrow. A little bit of stress. <laughs> That's okay. Because I feel that I'm, I'm probably right about here. So I'm okay. <laughs> All right. But the thing is, okay, so I bring that up. View the problem rationally. So as I'm freaking out about this, this, this water heater, how am I going to deal with this? I got to leave to come here. It's, it's 1 o'clock when I notice this. And I leave at 1.30 to come here. That gives me half an hour. What are we going to do? Hey, let's think about it rationally. Number one, the house is fine. We've got it taken care of on the inside. The damage is all cleaned up. We're now at the end of the painting phase. Contractors will be in to put the floor in a couple days. It's concrete. We're good to go. We get to two story. We're fine upstairs. It's 108 degrees outside. I'll take a cold shower when I get home. It probably is going to feel good, right? So it's just, don't worry about it. It's easy for me to say, right? Take a break. How about share the load? Um, take it out on someone. <laughs> uh, kick the dog. No, sorry, Zeus. Okay. 
I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> Take out this one. It's not one of them. But you know, if it works, uh, <laughs> we'll draw a line through it. All right. Uh, I have exercise. You know what's good exercise? Pulling out a hot water. It's not a hot water. It's pulling out a water heater. Uh, talk with someone. I thought about it, but you need a three-quarter inch line, and I have to run a new gas line. See, yeah, thought about it. Hey, notice drowning your sorrows in a bottle of something is not on this list, right? Because alcohol is probably not a good thing. Although, I shouldn't say this with the mic on. Best place I ever worked at, boss's drawer, lower right hand cabinet, bottle of really good scotch and a couple of glasses. So when things got real bad, you bring out the scotch, talk you through it, let you go home. <laughs> I'm not advocating that, I'm just saying. It's, <laughs> it's the way it was. <laughs> Told you I liked that job. Uh, okay, um, uh, stress. Lack of awareness. We have anything for Waka. Oh, this one's funny. Uh, uh, funny but lack of a maintenance crew is performing maintenance so we're talking about lack of awareness right so we're looking for somebody wasn't paying attention maintenance crew is performing maintenance on landing gear and inadvertently retracted the gear gear goes up should not have done that uh, they used airbags to raise the aircraft but okay right there they said a whole pile of airbags and you inflate them all right uh, but and this is the lack of awareness part. In hindsight, we can say that perhaps someone should have walked around the aircraft before applying the air. So we got, I did this one right. <laughs> Oops, a little bit too much air and left the jack underneath the horizontal stabilizer, which is now going through the horizontal stabilizer. That's a bad thing. Um, I have heard many, many stories about high wing Cessnas with retractable gear. If you've worked on Cessnas with retractable gear, the first thing you learn is they don't just go up. They go down 18 inches and then go up. And they don't go up this way, they go, here they go down and back. And so if you have it on a jack, first it pushes the airplane up and then forward and the jacks, so you have high wing jacks on the, on the wings and so the, the jack pad is sitting on the wing, it pushes the airplane up, and then the jack goes to the fuel tank. <coughs> so that happens more often than you care to think about. So when you're working on Cessnas, the first thing you, before you, you jack them up and you always make sure you follow the manual and you measure how far that gear is. So lack, lack of awareness, is that what we're on? Yeah, lack of awareness. Failure to be alert or vigilant. Oops, spelled this correctly. V I G I L A N T in observing. Okay, okay Tim, the guy who uh, is not here right now, but uh, was here yesterday and today a little bit doing some projects for me, he works as a fueler in uh, the various airports. It's, it's one company that he fuels international, he fuels at Executive and out at uh, uh, Mather. And I, I did believe he was working, uh, it was a few weeks ago, out at Executive, I think it was. And they were pushing an aircraft, a, a fairly nice, I think it was a Citation 10, I and mean, this is a corporate jet, pushing it into a hangar. Everybody's watching, watching, watching. Nobody bothered to look up and watch the tail went right into the back of the hangar. You're, you're talking millions of dollars of damage in something like that. Uh, safety net. Uh, consider, oops, that's A, consider the consequences your actions 
Okay, by that, you have to stop and think about what is the worst case scenario if I do what I'm doing incorrectly? Right, sometimes it's, um, uh, you know, like when I was doing engines, you'd have a, a gear, maybe something like a gear. It's got a little, little bit of a damage on a tooth. You're like, well, you know, the book isn't exactly clear on this. It just says to look for like pitting or this or that. It's got, eh, maybe it's a little pitting. Do I call it? Do I not call it? It's just a little abnormal. Okay, let me think that through. What if I continue to use it? What could happen? Well, the gear could actually break and then the drivetrain fails and the engine fails and everybody crashes. Okay, I don't like that scenario, you know. Well, what's best case scenario? Best case scenario is it works, but it could shed some metal. Okay, I don't like any of those scenarios. Now it's gone. Um, talking about moving aircraft, I'm gonna tell you right now, when it comes to moving aircraft, good luck finding me. I would make myself scarce. I would find the job nobody else wanted to do and I'd go do it so they wouldn't pull me off of it. I do not like moving aircraft. It's just too many bad things happen for no reason. So, uh, let's see, safety net ask others to look over your work. We've seen that before. Ask for help, especially when moving aircraft. It's, I see a lot of damage happen there. All right, we're going to talk about the last one. So you don't call them spotters when guys... Uh... Wing walkers, spotters, whatever you want to do. Uh, as I mentioned before, I was in the Navy, but I was not in Navy aviation. I was in uh, was shipboard uh, maintenance. And, uh, but we had an air detachment, which was two CH-46 helicopters. They're like a Chinook, but smaller, the dual rotor ones. And so we had an air detachment, and I was on the firefighting crew that was uh, for flight ops. So I was always standing there with them and made friends with them. And so I got, you know, working with them and doing stuff with them. And I love the way they moved aircraft. Um, it's like every guy has a whistle. And they had a whole team walking around the aircraft. And anybody sees anything they don't like, a whistle blows. Somebody's sitting in the aircraft. They hit the brakes instantly. Everything stops. Nobody moves until somebody figures out why did the whistle go? What's going on? Um, still do that like that? Uh, I'm not part of it. Uh, you're downstairs, huh? Yeah, he's, he's, a <laughs> he's a snipe. Yeah, I like that plan. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I have to laugh. I, you guys may not have noticed it, but the video I showed. So we got, we got Parker. Parker graduate, guys? Yeah. Yeah, Parker graduated. Uh, Parker is, is, is uh, ex-Special Forces. He has arms that make my legs look, uh, I mean, they're just in big guy. And he's in one of the videos, and they're moving back one of the, um, the Sky Masters, and you can see the need to turn, he's a wing walker. He just grabs the wing and moves there. <laughs> you can't, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> All right, norms. Uh, I'm gonna tell you, this is, this is my absolute favorite of the Dirty Dozen, because I think this is the quintessential one right here. There's two things about this one, then we'll go on break one. I'm gonna run a little long so we can do this one, all right? Um, this one is actually the, has the most most shock value, and is the one that gets most people. So norms is informal work practices or unwritten rules that are accepted. accepted by the group not the FAA nobody else it's just well that's the way we do things here all right and that's exactly how it's stated it's exactly what happens when you hear that's the way we do things here that's the way we've always done things you need to your your you know warnings should go off in, in your head so let's talk about I want to go to oh, uh, all right. Most of the cartoons we've looked at, we saw one where the, where the high wing made sense, but a lot of them didn't. So this one right here, in just passing, you would look at this and okay, so there's a guy sitting on a fork truck, he's raising a little engine here. He says, never mind the maintenance manual, it's quicker the, this, the, the way we do it here. So he's changing out an engine using a fork truck. All right, um, see, norms in the context, dirty dozen means our group has a better way to do the job than the published procedure. Tribal memory, peer pressure, habit, or other terms used to describe the norms. In the following case, someone discovered a very creative way to accomplish a task that saved 12 hours of labor. 
I want you to keep this in mind. 12 hours of labor is what was saved. What was lost? I'm just going to go with a picture. <laughs> this picture was taken by an amateur photographer seconds before an American Airlines DC-10 crashed at Chicago Air Airport after losing an engine during takeoff. Below is a resulting explosion. Improper maintenance procedure is the blame. 271 people on board were killed, as well as two on the ground. How much time did they save? So I think I, I, that's where their Pete was. Um, Are you stress on the bolt or something? Yeah, I'll explain. So, um, so 79, I remember this, uh, after losing an engine on takeoff. So the engine, I, I believe the engine, um, well, it's under the wing, so it just actually fell off and ripped off. The failure was a cracked flange by an engine pylon assembly caused by maintenance procedure. During the procedure, the engine and pylon were supported by a fork truck, while some of the pylon's attachment connections to the wing were removed. Others were left in place. During the procedure, the forklift's hydraulics leaked, so that it had to be adjusted from time to time, so the fork truck kept. So you have to start it up and raise it, start it up and raise it. At some point, they ran out of fuel. Came down even more. Later tests showed that under these conditions, leakage would allow a drift of one inch in 30 minutes. During the investigation, it was determined a movement of half inch would produce a seven inch fracture of this flange holding the engine on. The resulting crash that killed 271 people aboard the aircraft, as well as two on the ground. Unfortunate fact is there was at least one additional fatality not on the official list for American Airlines Flight 191. One of the maintenance committed suicide. That to me is powerful. It's powerful. It's uh, you can see in this photo right here. There is no engine. It just came off. So we're talking about norms. Nobody was a bad guy in this situation. And that's what I keep saying over and over. They're not bad people. Um, it's, it's James Reason has a, a comment that he says, talks about the more responsibility you have, the higher your position, the greater your mistakes become. And one of the examples he gives is like Blue Angels or um, the Thunderbirds. When they make a mistake, it's catastrophic. It's not because they're bad pilots. They're the best of the best. It's just at that level, even the smallest of mistake is catastrophic. So the more, the higher you, you get in your, your career field, no matter what it is, the greater the, the odds are. But we go back to the dirty dozen. This didn't need to happen. What it was in the maintenance procedure, they were supposed to use a very specific tool, and I believe it was you're supposed to remove the engine and the pylon, I think, at the same time, which is the thing that goes up to the wing. And, and uh, these guys figured out, hey, if we don't use that, and we use the fork truck, and we can save some time, we can do it. How much time they save? 12 hours per engine. Now you gotta imagine going up to the boss, going, boss, I can swap out an engine 12 hours. It's like two shifts faster than the next crew. What's the boss say? Let's do, do it, man. All right, it's what you don't know that's gonna get you. So, all right, we'll finish this up, write some notes, and then we'll go on a break. All right, some norms. So I'm gonna get you on this one all the time, because like I said, um, you're gonna come up to me and I'm gonna, and I'll notice. So, huh, what'd you do it that way? I know why you did it that way. Because I just noticed the person right before you did it the same way. So what can we do to get around this? Well, first of all, as an as a inexperienced junior mechanic, I can't say don't ask other people, right? That's the wrong thing to do. But you kind of have to start with a place of knowledge, right? So it's like in, in your project sheets, you don't want to just go, all right, I'm moving on to project two. How'd you do project two? I didn't even put you on the spot. He's freaking out. It's like, oh, why are you picking on me? I didn't do anything wrong. So, <laughs> so, right, you want to read through it, know what it says, and then if you don't understand something, please, I'm here. That's I love those questions. That's my favorite question. I read through this, and what you wrote right here doesn't make sense. And Robert came up to me today. What you wrote here doesn't make sense. I'm like, yeah, it's because that's wrong. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, you know, okay, you notice something comes up. Hey, that doesn't look right. Hey, you're right. It's not right. That's a problem right there. So, you know, those are great questions. I read this and I don't understand. Uh, not, well, what, do, what do I do now? How do I do it? It's, uh, have, have uh, good questions. So, always. Always use written instructions. If you don't have written instructions to do it in aviation, 
I want to say a good rule of thumb, but it's more than a rule of thumb. It's almost a law. You can't do it. If it's not written somewhere, you can't do it. That's just the end of the story. All right? I can tell you a story about how uh, my, my company got in just a little bit of trouble because we were doing something that I learned to do in this school. I went out in the field. I worked for an engine shop that was a premier engine shop. The guy who I took it over had been doing work for an engine shop even better than the one before. He showed me how to do it. And everybody did it. And we did this one thing. And it made the engines better. And it was fantastic. And it was uh, refacing rocker arms. And uh, one day the FA goes, where, where, where's your data for that? Oh, it's in the book. It's got to be. Well, show me where it's in the book. I read the whole book. It's not in the book. That's weird. Read another book. Not in that book either. Read all kinds of books. Wasn't in any book. Started calling around, asking other maintenance shops. Hey, you guys are a repair station for engines? Yeah. You guys free face rock arms? All the time. What data do you use? It's in the book. So, yeah, what page? Uh, I don't know. Call me back when you find it. They call me back an hour later. It's not in the book, man. I'm like, I know. <laughs> so, I'm calling all up and down California. Not a single engine shop knows. I, I finally called some place in Texas who I had a relationship with. And I said, hey, uh, you guys reface rock arms all the time. Sure do. Where's your data? Oh, we have special tech data. We wrote an op spec, had FA approval. This is not in the book, you know. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the way I went to the FA and said, okay, here's, you know, oh, yeah, we're, we, we're naughty. We shouldn't have done this. And uh, how about I write an op spec for it and get data? And, and so I got the data from a place in Texas. And uh, then I wrote my own procedures. And I went to the FAA. And they said, engineering, engineering, take a stamp. Which, you can do that now. Hands it back to me. Okay, we can do it now. So, you know, there's, so I told you I like the FA. Um, so, uh, don't just ask someone. Don't just ask. Read it first, then ask. Uh, do not assume. That what someone else did makes it correct. I love that when people ask people, why would you do it that way? Well, that's the way he did it. <laughs> okay. And then I look, do you guys notice the Dirty Dozen posters in the class yet? Yeah. It's really helpful when you're doing that project, isn't it? Nobody noticed the Dirty Dozen posters at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's how you knew that project. Um, now I'm going to point to the posters and say, well, which one is that? You know, say, it's norms. All right. Just because it is normal does not make it correct. And at this point, I think I have given you guys a whole bunch of dirty laundry that I've been aware of that's happened to me or people around me over and over, and I think that this is the main theme, right? Just because it's normal, we assumed at that point it was correct because we didn't have dirty dozen back then. So anyway, all right, so we'll take a break, 10 minutes.